Welcome to this evening's Parents and Family Forum. My name is Eric Lassan, and I'm from Parent Engagement, and I'm really glad that you're all here with us this evening. This evening's session will fo focus on key decisions that our students should be thinking about as they move through the rest of this academic year and beyond. And now let's begin. I'm excited to introduce our moderator this evening, Cecily McCaffrey. Professor McCaffrey serves as Associate Dean of Curriculum and Student Success. She teaches courses in Asian history with primary focus on the modern period. Her courses include a four semester sequence in Chinese history ranging from the medieval era to present day, as well as specialized courses in environmental history, war and memory, and popular resistance movements. Her classes emphasize skill building, in close reading, critical analysis, and historical writing. Now I'll turn it over to you, Cecily. Well, thanks so much, Eric, and thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, we've got a great group of panelists um, who are here to um, give you some information about opportunities, both academic um, and related to student life, um, both here uh, at the Salem campus, um, the College of Arts and Sciences, um, sort of extending to computing and data science as well, and then in the Portland campus at uh, the Portland Northwest College of Art. Um, so you'll see all of our panelists' names in front of you here on the screen, and I will invite folks as they their turn comes to present to introduce themselves to you. So again, um, I'm Cecily McCaffrey. Um, I sometimes think I have the most the longest title on campus, but I have been proven wrong. Um, I'm serving currently as a faculty associate dean of curriculum and student success, and I'm also a professor in the history department and I use she, her pronouns. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about um, the major. We actually just started registering today for um, spring courses here at the Salem campus um, in the College of Arts and Sciences. So there's a lot of excitement and you're probably already hearing from your students um, about the classes they're excited to take in the spring. Turns out the best procrastination ever when you're hitting the end of the semester is to think about the next one. Um, so there's a lot of really great energy here on campus. Um, I wanted to use a, a, a slightly um, random metaphor to talk to you a little bit about um, key decisions in the academic um, process going towards the bachelor's degree. And um, so focusing in particular on the major, a lot of students come in thinking about what it is they want to focus on, in particular, and the major tends to symbolize that. Um, but of course, um, in a liberal arts college, what we're really thinking about is both breadth and depth. So if you will, I'm going to offer you the metaphor of a tree. Um, and so the breadth part of things is sort of the roots. Um, we wanna prepare our students, not just for their first job, um, but for their second, third jobs, fourth careers, retirement pursuits, just to build a really strong um, foundation for them. The major, however, is an opportunity to really explore a certain subject in depth. And so I might offer that as the trunk of the tree, right? That's sort of your core. Um, focus there. And really, that's why, um, as an educator, we think about the importance of a major um, as being quite crucial because it's a student deciding to really explore something um, to a significant degree. Uh, the timing of things happens differently at different um, colleges, but here in the College of Arts and Sciences, we generally encourage students to, um, they they must declare by the end of their second year, or the end of their fourth semester, um, because we're looking for them to kind of spend the next two years doing some of that in-depth and upper level work. Um, but sometimes we'll declare as early as the second semester. There is no rush. Um, usually um, our students are getting great advice just in terms of thinking about exploring different options and beginning to start a plan. Um, maybe you're interested in computer science. So you took that first course, it's going great. And you're thinking, okay, it's time for me to take the second one. Do you need to declare your major right away? Not necessarily, you can if you want, but just to, to kind of get um, some exposure to um, the fields that you're interested in, um, broadly speaking. And then from there, um, our students may sort of build on that um, and moving into thinking about double majors, for example, um, maybe sort of two specialized pursuits that are really attracting you. But there's always opportunities to kind of develop different kinds of interests. Um, our Minor programs here in the College of Arts and Sciences require five courses, five to six courses usually, that are take sort of giving a, a slice 
um, of a particular disciplinary form. Um, so many of our students are excited about kind of exploring more than one thing and provide getting that kind of balance. Um, we do actually offer the opportunity for students to pursue an individualized major if they have um, an interest that they feel is not being perfectly met by the programs that we offer here. Um, that is a very specialized pursuit. We ask students to work together with faculty members and actually also with us here in the Dean's office to design a program that's going to have sort of the rigor and robustness that we expect um, of our undergraduate programs. Um, and the last thing to mention here is many of our students, as you are probably well aware, are interested in pursuing some of the dual degree programs um, that are available here at Will Limit. Um, for example, the three plus three um, bachelor's and JD program, three plus two um, bachelor's and um, master's of business administration program, um, three plus one master's and data sort of BS uh, in, and master's in data science um, as well. So all of this is kind of there's multiple opportunities for students to pursue. Um, as I'll say in just a minute, they don't need to make those decisions in their first semester, or even in their first year. There's a lot of benefits in waiting and exploring a little bit, um, but there are opportunities for them to really focus and develop to kind of grow that tree, if you will allow. Um, the next thing I'd like to offer is um, thinking about shall we say the branches, um, complementary paths that your students might pursue as they're thinking about um, developing and forming their interests. Um, there, I definitely want to highlight internships um, as one possible pathway. A lot of our students are really, really interested in pursuing internships. We're ideally placed across the street from Oregon State Capitol. Um, the legislative session is about to start in 2023, and many of our um, students will be working um, across the street and sort of inter legislative based um, internships. That's one kind of um, great example of that. Um, there's also summer research opportunities, um, particularly in the sciences. Uh, our students work closely with the faculty on developing research, and oftentimes that research becomes part of their own um, academic pathway as they will work on their final um, coursework in the topics related to summer research. Um, Great opportunities to work on campus or close by. Um, and also there are a number of grant opportunities so students can apply to pursue a project of their own design and get funding to support that project. If your student is in their first year, your students will have learned of what's called um, the College Colloquium Research Grant. It's um, designed to fund a summer opportunity. Um, it is an application-based and competitive program, um, but students present their own projects and then they um, have to tie it somehow to the theme uh, or content of their college colloquium. So they're even at, in that their first semester, they're invited to apply for a grant that they could possibly um, win and um, utilize the following summer. But there are also other internal grants as well as um, external grants that we're ready to support your students in. Um, so the, the takeaway point here is um, we all know how busy emails can get, uh, but please remind your students to check their emails because oftentimes these opportunities are being advertised to them. Um, via the university email system so they might learn of something they didn't hear about. Um, please pay a visit to our career development office. Um, they, we have wonderful, wonderful advisors and they focus on career communities as a concept. So if your student has a general sense of their interest, fantastic. Um, they can walk in and um, consult with one of the career communities advisors and get a good sense of possible major pathways they might wish to pursue. And the same is true for student grants and awards. Um, we offer a lot of support and are, are very willing to work with our students um, in pursuing the different opportunities, whether here on campus or externally funded grants as well. Um, so the last thing that um, I'd like to talk about is um, the, what shall I say, the importance of novelty or exploration, um, even though I'm talking about the sort of the role of depth um, and sort of building a strong trunk um, based on a solid foundation, um, it's really fantastic for our students to um, try something they haven't tried before. And it sounds very simple, um, but I must say, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to students about their eureka moments. Um, talking to a student who joined us as a transfer student um, after um, actually kind of coming to Willamette for a second bachelor's degree, um, focused on psychology, knew this is what she wanted to do, 
and took a public health class. And she was said, wow, this is amazing. So someone who's already completed a degree knew exactly what she wanted to do and took a class just on a whim and it changed her trajectory. Um, so that's just one of many examples that I've heard. Um, our faculty here are always offering sort of new, occasional, one-time only, or introducing new topics kinds of classes. So there's plenty of opportunities um, for students to try something new and kind of learn together with our faculty as we explore uh, different fields in a changing world. So it's great to plan and have a good sense of what you want to do and where you are, but we really want to encourage our students to also be spontaneous, take some risks, try something they haven't tried before. Um, I'm going to uh, ask my colleague Jackson to speak just briefly about um, the processes at PNCA as well. Uh, but PNCA, the first year is the foundation year. And in the second semester, there's actually a majors fit week that allows students to explore different options and um, then pick which pathway they want to pursue for the BFA. Um, but Jackson, do you mind just jumping in for a minute and, and talking a little bit about um, how that process works at PNCA as well? Sure. Yeah. Uh, as Cecily mentioned, um, all of our first year, first year to college students, first year to PNCA students do what we call the foundation year, um, where they all take a very similar curriculum to each other, um, really kind of giving them the foundation, hence the name, um, of skills that they're going to need moving forward for their second, third, fourth plus years. Um, and as Cecily mentioned, we have something called Majors Week, um, where all of the various majors and minors will um, have little events or programs all week long to kind of show exactly what um, that major is all about. Um, we talk about some of the things that students will be learning in those majors. Um, that system is designed because we have a lot of students who are coming in um, already as you know practicing artists and um, may think that they know exactly what they want to do, what their practice is going to be. But the foundation year is designed to expose them to maybe other um, practices, other mediums that they may not be considering um, so that they can either you know make the most informed choice for themselves or um, utilize some of those other mediums in the practice they know that they already wish to pursue. Um, so students at PNCA typically declare by the end of their first year um, for what they're going to be pursuing with their BFA. All students, all undergraduate students get a BFA, a Bachelor's of Fine Arts, um, with a specialization in one of the uh, various majors that we have. Great. Thanks so much, Jackson. Um, so, uh, you know, being a professor and uh, someone who stands up in front of students and lectures, I could go on and on and on about all the different aspects of the academic experience, but we have a much richer panel for you um, today. So I'm happy to pass the baton uh, to my colleague in student engagement and leadership, Tony Stafford. Hello. Uh, thank you, Cecily. My name is Tony Stafford, the Director of Campus Recreation. I'm representing the SEAL office tonight, which is the Student Engagement and Leadership Office. And some of the opportunities for kind of key decision-making processes are, is our common student leadership application process. Um, it's an annual university-wide kind of undergraduate process where students can apply for a variety of roles. And we do this because it's so it's streamlined. Students can apply for several positions that they might be interested in. So then when they're offered several opportunities, they can decide which one is what they, which one they most likely would like to do. And so you can kind of see the list of positions there. We have resident assistants that are available, which uh, maybe Heather might talk a little bit about that here shortly. We have our opening days leaders, which they support the first year experience for um, orientation. So that week before school starts, there's a lot of student leaders that are needed in that role. We have our colloquium assistants, which are uh, typically uh, juniors and seniors, but with the large class we have, I know they're going to be opening it up to uh, second year students as well to be CAs, which help kind of prepare, help support first years in their um, kind of uh, foundation class, their chase class and their foundation kind of uh, um study or study class that they sign up with a faculty member. So there'll be uh, a variety. I think this year they had 40, 30, not 40, 34 CAs that they needed to support the incoming class. So they'll, they'll need some students there. 
We have our pre-orient our Ohana pre-orientation leaders, which is part of our Jumpstart program, and we also have a service leadership and social change pre-orientation Jumpstart program. Um, we also we have already uh, because of some uh, difficulties with staff and study abroad, we have already opened up our outdoor instructor positions for the outdoor program and stepping out. So if there are students that are interested in that space, they can uh, chat with our outdoor program leader, our outdoor program staff, or me as a campus director, they can reach out to me if, if that's of interest. Um, so we will not be a part of the common application process because we needed to move forward a little bit more quickly to train some staff to be prepared for the spring. Um, so that process will open up uh hopefully before winter break then students can apply over winter break if they wish at the latest it will happen in january and then students can fill out the application process they'll have interviews and then offers will go out sometime at the early march and then training will happen in the spring for some of those programs and then if not it'll happen in the summer other engagement opportunities for leadership, we have our in the springtime, as well as kind of moving into the wintertime, a lot of people are graduating and a lot of transitions are happening with club leadership and different student organizations. So if your children or your students are uh, wanting to really engage in certain clubs, they can take on some leadership opportunities there. A fraternity and sorority life is always recruiting and opening to take on students that want to engage in fraternity and sorority life. Um, of course, there's always a variety of uh, uh, jobs on campus where students can get leadership opportunities. So Handshake is our platform where students can apply for different jobs on campus. Uh, we have our committees and student government for ASWU. They're uh, definitely in the springtime as well as moving into the wintertime, they're always taking on uh, students that want to be engaged in supporting change within the organization from a student lens. We have our WU LEAD program, which is our leadership institute. We're offering a leadership institute uh, experience in the spring. Students can enroll in that. There should be some marketing information hopefully coming out in the next couple of weeks where the students can like decide if they want to engage in some leadership development, if they might have had some issues during with COVID where they haven't been able to gain as much leadership opportunity. This could be a good uh, platform for students to kind of enhance and, and learn a little bit about how they, their leadership uh, approach uh, and development can help support the different organizations they're working for, or, or just uh, also just with any type of employment moving forward. Another great resource is just asking their advisors um, kind of like Cecily had talked about, there's a lot of, you know, faculty that are looking for research supports. There's tutoring opportunities out there. So asking advisors and professors and uh, employers for other kind of leadership opportunities, if that's of interest. And then uh, we can go to the next slide. Awesome. So something that's also happening for... Uh, in the campus recreation program is we're offering a short-term international learning adventure. Um, because of COVID, we have had not been able to do some of these kinds of experiences. So uh, this year we're offering a May 28th to June 12th uh, international learning adventure. It's kind of a civic engage, it's a community engagement, civic engagement program with the outdoor program. And we'll be doing some backpacker style travel, we'll be doing some adventure experiences with canyoneering, zip lining, homestays, service projects, hiking, kind of whitewater rafting. You can kind of see all the activities there. We have a bunch of informational sessions that students can come and engage in and learn about the, the process. Um, Signups will officially happen on December 2nd. We, we do, we can only offer 11 spots. We try to keep it a small, compact group. And our niche for this is to like, you know, there's a lot of students that are doing study abroad, but there's a lot of students that cannot. So we're trying to fill a niche here where we can offer some short term experiences where they get a chance to do a homestay. They get the chance to, to study abroad, learn the language a little bit if they wish and they so desire. Um, and so uh, we basically do first come first serve. We do like a 5 a.m. kind of sign up. Anybody that comes to an info session is on our listserv and they all get a email at 5 a.m. And it's kind of like click on the button saying, yes, I want to join. And it's 
uh, usually fills up fairly quickly. Um, this is the cost is the 1675. It does not include flights. So flights would have to get to Costa Rica, you know, passport, souvenirs, other kind of things. And then next year, I know that uh, I've been working with uh, a fac two faculty members, uh, Wendy Boring and David Gutterman, um, who are preparing another short-term kind of uh, adventure experience. It might be for credit. It might just be for uh, just another short-term experience for next year for the Camino de Santiago. It's in Portugal experience. So if like Costa Rica is not their style and they want to go hike the Camino in Portugal next year, that's going to be the next option. Our hope is to have a four-year rotation. Costa Rica will be one. The Camino will be one. Maybe Peru, Machu Picchu will be a third. And then to be determined on the fourth, um, we'll see what strikes anyone's fancy to build a partnership. So these are some opportunities where students can kind of learn and engage uh, in a different kind of capacity. And um, yeah, so I think I think that's it for my slides. Yes. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Jackson Seymour. I am the Associate Director of Student Life. Uh, at our Pacific Northwest College of Art campus up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I use he, him as pronouns. I'm representing our Office of Student Affairs. Um, I am here to talk, similarly to what Tony was just talking about with some of the opportunities on the Salem campus, um, I'm here to talk about some of those uh, similar or analogous opportunities up at our PNCA campus. Um, some of the leadership opportunities that we have available up at PNCA um, are our student council, um, so our student council is very similar to a student government um, at any other kind of uh, educational institution, uh, but they operate very much on a council mentality. All students at PNCA are invited to attend every student council meeting um, to offer their input, their vote, um, their thoughts, their concerns, their questions, their congratulations, any, any of those. Um, and that Council is run by a leadership team of elected students. Um, those elected positions are open again to any uh, PNCA student, um, whether you're a first year or about to graduate um, in the next year, you are more than welcome to uh, run for one of our elected positions. And they're a great leadership opportunity um, and provide a lot of various um, learning opportunities and ways to learn and flex some new skills. Um, we also have uh, several clubs at PNCA um, they kind of break down into three kind of broad categories. We have our kind of hangout and hobby clubs, which, um, you know, think things like movie club where they just kind of get together to hang out and watch movies or magic, the gathering club or dungeons and dragons club where they get together around a common interest, um, to engage in that common interest. We also have several practice based clubs. So think things like, um, a puppet fabrication club or, painting and drawing club. So the, the purpose of those clubs is centered around an art practice. And then we also have several affinity-based groups. Um, so we have a Students of Color Coalition, a queer union. Um, we're in the process of establishing a neurodivergent student union um, where students gather together around um, a shared or common identity um, for community programming and safe spaces. Um, it's very easy for students to either get involved in a club or to start their own at PNCA. We try to make that barrier to entry pretty low. Um, so if there is a student who has some kind of a hobby or interest and doesn't see a club represented by the registered ones we have, um, it's very easy for them to start their own. They pretty much just need four friends um, and a faculty or staff advisor. And our office is more than happy to help to try to facilitate some of that for them. Um, we, similarly to the opening days leaders, have orientation ambassadors, which are um, student leaders who help facilitate our new student orientation in the fall semester. Um, this position is similarly to the ones Tony was mentioning, also part of that common application process. Um, so students can apply for this role um, through that same process. But these students help to make new student orientation happen. They serve as guides, answer questions, um, and kind of provide that um, lived student experience for the incoming class. Um, and then there are other work opportunities on our campus as well. 
um, whether that be just in a departmental office, i.e. I, if we have student life assistant positions, there are, are student workers who uh, work in our technology office. Um, there are also roles that tie more into practice. There are gallery attendants and things like that for students to kind of get some of that experience of what it might be like working in an actual gallery. Um, some of the processes for applying for those roles, um, as I mentioned with those student council leadership roles, um, it's as simple as attending a student council meeting during election time. And we make that uh, very known to students, postings everywhere, all about it on all the public ways that we have to reach our students. Uh, but all you have to do is attend and make it known that you're there to run for one of those roles. Um, uh, the orientation ambassador positions, as I said, are a part of that common application. Um, we all our work positions are also on Handshake, so I would encourage students to check that out, or they can check in with our Office of Career Design. Um, and then uh, the advisors and department heads are also um, great resources for our students who are looking for ways to um, get involved. Um, there are students who... Um, maybe a little bit atypical for most undergraduate experiences, but some of the ways that they express their leadership skills are um, with their own independent exhibitions. So we have several gallery spaces on our campus where students can, independent of anything that's going on in their courses, um, have an exhibition of their work. Um, they just work with uh, our staff member who kind of oversees and coordinates that process. Um, and they can have a show in any of the gallery spaces that we have on campus. Um, and there's just a form for that that they fill out. So that's the process for applying for that. But I believe that's all I have. And so we can move on to Heather, I believe, is next. Thanks, Jackson. Um, my name is Heather. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Director of Residence Life and Student Conduct. I've been here for five months on my sixth month, so it's so great to be joining the Willamette community. Um, I'm based out of um, Salem, but I work fairly closely with our area coordinator who lives in the residence halls up at PNCA. But I um, wanted to share a little bit about the resident advisor position, and as Tony shared, it is part of that common application, which I love that we have that here because it really gives students an author to their own decision of what kind of process they would want to be involved with, which not a lot of institutions do. So it's really exciting to have one central application for students to say all of the things of what they want to be involved with and then gives them really the autonomy to let them author their own decisions of how they want to be involved, which is really awesome. So um, not that I think that the RA position is the best position, but it is a good fit for some people. Um, with our RA position, I really think it's a great professional development opportunity along with all of the other positions positional leadership roles. Specifically, the RA roles, what I've, what I've known by some research and working with resident assistants for the past 15 or so years is that it really helps our students develop communication and listening skills along with compassion and empathy because part of the role of being a resident assistant is we ask them to have one-on-one -on -one engagement um, connect conversations with every student multiple times per semester. And those are really care-based um, conversations where we want students to feel like they matter and that they are cared for. Um, it also develops their organizational skills and responsibility skills, which I think I can learn a lot about. So um, I think it's a really great opportunity for students to get involved, but that all happens in February. Um, and if your student hasn't met with their resident assistant, um, they still have the next few weeks to have their intentional conversations is what we call it. So um, encourage them to connect with their resident assistant. We have structured questions that we actually ask. Uh, we think about the student experience, and so we really see our resident assistant role being a pivotal moment for all of our students that are living on campus their first year to be able to um, grow and learn with, with, with a mentor that lives with them in their community. So encourage them to go meet with them if they haven't yet. Um, as a reminder, we have a first year live-on requirement for our Portland campus. Um, we do have a external link if you would like that. We can share that with you. It's called Cal College Housing Northwest. For those students who are at PNCA, it's a good resource to if you want to find um, apartments or spaces to live after your first year on campus. Here in Salem, we have a two-year live-on requirement, and we have availability for apartment-style living areas for upper division students. 
for our juniors and seniors um, to, to live with us. And all of the housing, housing applications for our returning students will happen in, in February. And it's really important that students know that they have to sign their contract in order to go through the selection process. So um, that's my one key point here at this stage, and we'll put a pin in it because your student will get a lot more information on their Willamette email address. While I'm here with you, I just want to make sure that people know that our residence halls are open both on Salem and Portland campus, but there is um, not class, there's no class that is happening between November 21st and 25th. So here at Salem, that means that um, Gaudi, which is our dining venue, is closed for students. Um, and if students wanted a meal plan, they should have let us know like two days ago. So if your student is staying with us and they don't live in an apartment, it's just one thing to know that um, they will need to provide their own meal. Um, as far as winter break, our application is out for students to let us know when they are leaving. Uh, we ask when students are leaving just for us to know a little bit more information about our plans and how to close our building successfully. We have to go into each residential space to make sure that everything is ready to go for our break when people are not here with us for a few weeks. We do have an option for students who would like to stay with us over break if there's an extreme, ex, extreme circumstance where they need to stay over break. They can let us know and we can work with them to do that. There is a fee and a cost associated with that. Um, our halls close December 7th, 17th at 12 p.m. We tell students that um, after their last final, we ask them to leave after 24 hours. Um, and our halls do close that December 17th and they reopen January 14th at 9 a.m. Um, if you do have questions, you can always email housing at willamette.edu, and we'd be happy to answer any specific questions. Your students should have this all in email, so feel free to ask them to forward that to you, or feel free to ask us if you have any questions, but I'm happy to answer them. I see there's some questions up here that I'll try to get to, um, but let us know. We're here 8 to 5 every day at the Salem campus, and housing at uh, Willamette is, is where you'll ask us questions, and I'll pass it off to Chris. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Liu. I'm the Director of International Education. Uh, and so I just want to let you know that uh, obviously studying abroad is one of those key decisions that your students might be wanting to explore. Uh, and so here, you know, what I want to what I want to point out first is that we have many different types of study abroad programs that the students can access. Uh, basically, they are uh, designed uh, along uh, with the idea of um, uh, challenge and support in mind, recognizing that uh, many uh, we have many different types of students with different experiences and abilities coming in. Uh, and so some students uh, will need uh, quite a lot of support in order to study abroad uh, and a little bit a little bit less challenge in the program. Uh, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have students who are uh, well prepared and experienced uh, with uh, travel, et cetera, and um, need a program that has a, a lot more challenge and they don't require as much support. So we have different types of uh, programs, ways of studying abroad. Uh, one example that would be an exchange program that is a higher challenge, uh, lower support where this, our students go over to a partner university. And of course, a student comes from that university to study at Willamette in exchange. Um, uh, another, another type of program would be um, on the other end of the spectrum with a much higher support and, and a little bit less challenge would be a program uh, where the students go as a group um, and with a faculty member from Willamette, for example, um, and where the, uh, the, the parameters of the program are more uh, well-defined as opposed to going to another university and just being another student at another university. So uh, we have lots of exchange partners, uh, maybe as many as 35 to 40 uh, that um, we have in the meantime. But we also have a number of programs that are designed with high support, like the two pictures here, um, uh, they're illustrating two brand new programs that we're starting that are designed for um, semester long uh, faculty led programs where the students are going as a group uh, and um, studying in a locale with a very specific sort of um, curricular focus. 
Um, and uh, these two, uh, the one on the right um, is for art students, uh, an art semester program. The one in the lower left is for uh, political science, international study, sociology, uh, to do study democratic uh, institutions, that kind of thing. But we have many other programs, of course, to uh, meet the needs of all students for all majors. Um, we, we are now in the season of uh, the application season with the deadline of December 6. We're seeing lots of students, um, both uh, first year students and uh, sophomores. Typically, um, it is the sophomores who are applying now to study abroad uh, next year. Um, that include next year meaning uh, summer programs, short, short term summer programs. Uh, fall semester programs, and spring semester of 2024 programs, as well as students who want to study a full year. Uh, that is also possible. Uh, that's not to say that um, first-year students can't apply now. They can to study abroad next year as a sophomore. That's possible, as well as junior students applying now to study abroad first semester senior year. Uh, typically, it's mostly the juniors who will be abroad, but um, those other two groups um, can also be accommodated. Um, yeah, uh, the the process of applying is important to know that the you know, the students uh, they can they can get information on um, our website. Uh, they can just search international education; they'll get right to our uh, web page and then explore study abroad programs. And, and all the information, of course, is there uh, for them to uh, research what kinds of possibilities exist. But um, we also have staff in the Office of International Education ready uh, and eager to meet with the students, to discuss the options, to help the students discern what is best for them, uh, not only where to go, and where, where they can get certain kinds of classes and so on that they're interested in, but also the type of program that I was uh, talking about in the beginning, that, you know, what's best, what, what's going to be the best situation for the right kind of challenge for the student in order to get the most out of the experience. So I'll, I'll stop with that, and we can take uh, questions at this point, I believe. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's been uh, really wonderful to hear about all the different opportunities. Um, it, I know it can probably seem a little bit overwhelming. I, I thought I would just offer a couple of brief anecdotes. One is um, what a pleasure it is for us as faculty to work with your students as they're um, exploring these different opportunities. Uh, so just to cite one example, um, Tony mentioned these different leadership opportunities. Uh, the College Colloquium Associate, um, who not only helps to guide first-year students in their very first seminar on campus, but also works so closely with the faculty members. Um, and it, it really is a, a sort of an opportunity to collaborate um, with a student who's had a couple of years experience on campus as a teacher um, in seeking to better connect um, with our students and support them as whole people, um, not just as intellectuals, but as, as people with all sorts of different gifts, talents, um, but also uh, needs as well. And the same, of course, goes for uh, students who st are, have the opportunity to study abroad. We are thrilled that we are able to get students um, studying abroad again after it's been a couple of years of hiatus um, at this point. And uh, I know students who seize the opportunity as soon as they could um, to maybe squeeze in a study abroad session at the end, in their final year on campus if they had been with us um, during COVID lockdowns and the like. So it just adds so much um, to their education and also to their growth. And it's always a thrill um, to hear from them and hear about their adventures and experiences. We know there's some questions that you have for us. Um, and let's see, Eric, do you want to maybe do the work of, of tossing the questions out to us? Or we'll jump in and answer as we can. Absolutely. Um, the first one I see is regarding majors. Do they change majors beyond the fourth semester? And if so, how does that how does that affect their graduation date if they change after their sophomore year? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, in most cases, it won't, it, it should be just fine to make a shift. Most often our students are changing a major 
to a, a, a field that they've already done some coursework in. Um, so something that's complementary um, to the work that they've done. There are few majors on campus where you really would have to have your path pretty much set um, by the second year. Our um, Bachelor of Science of Business Administration program is pretty much a full two years of coursework. So essentially, if you hadn't done a single business class and declared at the very end of your second year and took a class and didn't love it and then wanted to change, it would probably be okay. The reverse might not be true, right? That you you would have to sort of catch up a little bit, um, which is why we're really encouraging students in their first couple of years to explore. Um, and, you know, you're interested in business, try that class. Um, and if you're starting on that pathway and then are making a shift later on, it's okay. Um, it, we're, you're not likely to encounter too much difficulty. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, this next question, I think, Chris, this is going to be for you. Um, and this is the case of a sophomore who's majoring in a foreign language. And their advisor um, mapped out a, a schedule, a curriculum, I guess, uh, of courses that um, has study abroad semester in the fall of their senior year. Um, is that a change in study abroad philosophy just in terms of usually having students study away in their in their uh, junior year? No, no, it's not a it's not a change. You know, usually it is junior year, but um, we certainly can accommodate students uh, who need or want to study the fall semester of their senior year. That's that's been the case for uh, for quite some time. But sure, yeah, we typically have students studying abroad in their junior year. All right, thanks so much. Um, and I'm not sure this next question, if it's related to the Salem or Portland campuses, I guess we could answer it for both. But where's a good place for students to park their um, vehicles during the long holiday break? And probably Heather and Jackson, hopefully you can have some. I was going to say, that's a good question. I've never been here over break, but um, I was trying to look at our campus safety website. I don't see anything indicating that there would be a reason why students would have to consolidate to move their cars where they normally have a parking permit for, at least here um, on the Salem campus. And I would assume in Portland, if students have um, vehicles, they would have a normal parking garage that they would um park their car in. So that's what I would say with my with my limited knowledge. <laughs> yeah, for the PNCA campus, um, we do not have like a designated student parking lot during non-break times either. So um, wherever, if a student has brought their vehicle with them, wherever they're regularly parking them is like they really want to keep it. Um, as the uh, parking lot we have in front of the building is very limited, uh, primarily faculty staff, but there are a few student spots available. Um, but most of our students are pretty discouraged from um, bringing their cars, just given the location of our campus. Um, the downtown campus is not super conducive to that. But um, if they have brought their car, wherever they're parking it normally is probably where they'd want to keep it parked. I would also just add that uh, students should make sure that they've cleared their car of any items so it wouldn't make it look enticing to break into so um just clearing those cars out and um they can they can typically leave them in wherever they want to park them so but if they want to you know they could leave it in a more well-lit you know parking lot or anything like that that might be a better an option as well excellent thanks everyone um this next question chris i think is back to you um, for study abroad, could you mention, hopefully you know off the top of your head, some um, a few science-based programs? Yeah, um, so many of our exchange partners have, you know, the full array of science-based courses. Um, and so um, most of those uh, exchange partners, you know, offer their curriculum in English, even though sometimes they're in countries that uh, don't have English as the, you know, the main language. Um, but uh, many do, of course, like in New Zealand and the United Kingdom and so on. But those, but many others all around the world where students can access science-based curriculum. I would say as well, though, that um, like the two programs that I was talking about, uh, the faculty-led programs, the sort of the next one on the agenda to build and offer up will be a, an environmental science-focused uh, program in New Zealand. Um, 
So if that's the interest of the student, then that will be coming online during the 24-25 academic year is the plan. Excellent. And Chris, while you have your mic open, I think this next one is for you as well. Um, for In the case of an engineering student, um, is study abroad in their third year or something that's um, that's reasonably um, doable? Yeah, it's possible, but what's important is that the student in the first year um, of that three years, that they work with their academic advisor about the idea of studying abroad during the third year. Uh, it would be much more difficult if uh, the student has not thought about it or planned for it um, early on because that that particular curriculum is tight. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and Tony, I think this one, this next one is for you. Um, with regard to leadership positions, um, and Heather, you might, I, I know the RA position is compensated, I think, well, last I checked with room and board, but um, what is the compensation for the various leadership positions and does it vary by position? Um, it varies by position. Um, some of the positions like the RA position is a full year contracted position. Uh, the jumpstart position. Uh, positions are a very short term kind of leadership experience to help with the pre orientation before the orientation. And the uh, the CAs for the colloquium associates is uh, one semester. So based on that work time, they all are paid and it's just dependent upon each one. So when the students are applying for the positions, it should be located in the position announcement what their pay would be. And then the students can uh, earn that. And I'll let Heather talk about the RA stuff. I don't know if they get paid or how they're uh, how they're taken care of in regards to housing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, for the Salem campus, it's room and board. So we have um, whenever Gaudi or dining venue is open or if we have training for our staff, they're fed in the room. And the same with PNCA, it's uh, uh, the the room that they have up in uh, Portland and then they do get a meal stipend. And Eric, if I can jump in on that theme sure. and topic. Um, Internships can also be paid and compensated and students can simultaneously receive credit and um, pay for certain kinds of internships. Um, so it, our hope is that finances are not a barrier to students pursuing those kinds of opportunities as well. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, Heather, it looks like um, not everyone caught the, the details about the, um, the meal plan situation. Um, Oh, for the next term. Okay, so not for the break, but just when they um, figure out their and for the next for the next term, that makes me think that's next semester, and they already have their housing and meal plan for the spring. Is that correct? Yes, they do have their housing meal plan set for the spring, but you are given a grace period of that first week if you would like to change it at all. Okay, and then for the for the following year, um, for the twenty three twenty four school year. That housing application, I think you said the information is is coming out soon. Yeah, that process will happen in February. And so your student would get information about that. We're collecting information about winter break right now. But after we're done with that early December, we'll have more information out for those students um, who will live with us next year. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there is another question about vehicle security and, you know, Obviously, I think in any city, vehicle security is, is a concern and on a college campus when, um, you know, there are less people around, um, you know, that that becomes a concern. And so I think Tony's points about parking your car in a well-lit area, probably closer to buildings, um, is also a safe bet. And if your student is, is extra concerned about the security of their vehicle in terms of theft or break-in, um, then talk, consulting with campus safety directly, I think, will also um, yield maybe a little bit more specific directions um, in terms of how to maintain that, that vehicle safety to the best of their ability. Um, is a student, if a student's still undecided to uh, their major, um, do their advisors have um, students take career aptitude tests and help guide them in choosing a major? So these are you know, certainly steps that the academic advisor could, could work with students, but then also the Career Development Center, which I think, Cecily, you mentioned, but you might have a little bit more to this uh, answer. 
Yeah, I would definitely recommend um, that you, I feel like this is the lot of parents everywhere. You would say, did you go to career services? Did you go to career development? They're like, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go. Um, they should. They really, really should. You're right. They should go to career services. Um, they, um, you know, I've heard mentioned that they might use sort of like Myers-Briggs tests to give students a little sense of like, well, what kind of a person are you? What kind of opportunities might you like to do? Um, our um, associate director of career development, Anne Laporte, tells a wonderful, wonderful story about how she was on this perfect track and, you know, knew exactly what I want to say it was something like genetics as an undergrad and got a wonderful internship opportunity in genetics. And she thought it was so great. Like, what a fantastic opportunity. And she hated it. And one of the reasons she hated it is she was in a lab all day. And she is a very outgoing, gregarious person. And she thought, oh, I cannot spend the rest of my life doing this. This is not going to work for me as a person. So they do engage that. Um, we offer um, every semester, there are two courses that are each offered as a half semester course each. It's a single credit course. Um, most of our classes are four credits. So it's a single credit hour course. Um, I believe it's even a credit, no credit basis. Um, so there's not a lot of grade pressure. Um, but one is called career plans and decision making, which is a great way to sort of prime the pump of thinking about some of this. And the other is job and internship strategies, which is more about, okay, now that you know, you have this self-knowledge, go ahead and, and go forth and start to pursue it. Students don't have to take them in sequence. They can take one part, then the other, or just take one. It's not a problem. But um, I would recommend that course highly and most definitely, yes please send your student to career development. We'll talk to them as well as their academic advisors, but um, sometimes it can really help to have someone think about you as, as in a, in not just my student in my history class, but rather as, as somebody who's going to be engaging the world in different ways. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much. Here's a, I think this will be our last question for this evening as we're getting close to the end of our session. Um, but regarding grants, internships, and projects, who and where um, should students go to find out about these opportunities? That's I can kind of probably jump on that one. Open to everyone, but Cecily, start, I hope yeah, I can start that. with that one. Um, for the grants, um, we uh, the office is called Student Academic Grants and Awards, SAGA. Um, and so just searching Saga on our website will immediately get you to the, the list of grants. Um, Professor Jean Clark um, works very closely with our students in helping them to prepare. Um, internships, career services is a great place to start. Um, and in all things, it is we are sort of wrapping up one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of our students to prepare them for course registration here in the Salem campus. Um, and that's a great chance to connect with your advisor and say, you know, I'm kind of interested in this, or have you heard of anything about that? Um, so just those one-on-one -on -one conversations, and I think I'm echoing things that others have said as well in this regard, um, can really help. But let, I can, let, let's, uh, I'll invite others to jump in on this as well. Best, best advice for making the most of your time at Willamette. Well, and I'll say, while we're waiting for anybody else who might have a response, we will have a session on research opportunities um, in the spring. So, so do keep your eyes out for that. I believe that session is scheduled for uh, February, late February, early March. Um, so we will have much more specifics um, around some of those opportunities and how to access those. Um, and then with regard, someone else had asked earlier about recordings, and we do record these sessions, um, and we usually link them in the next edition of the Woo News newsletter that I hope you all receive, um, but you can also um, email us um, for the link to those, to those previously recorded sessions. And then also, last plug for career development, um, they do encourage students not only to come early, but often. So, you know, one uh, even just one stop to the career development office doesn't necessarily check that box. So do encourage them to, to go frequently um, as there's a lot of different opportunities through career development for them to further their, to connect with all these diff different types of opportunities, uh, but to also discern um, their interests as their um, academic um, experience unfolds. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and say thanks very much to our panelists this evening. Uh, for sharing all this information with us. And I hope that our audience found this information to um, be really 
helpful and valuable. And um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here with us this evening. And if you'd like to be in touch with a specific administrator from this evening's session, um, we'll follow up with a survey. Their, uh, their email addresses are here on the screen. Um, and we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. And we hope you join us again for future forums. And thanks again, everyone. And take care.